Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for coming to this session. I know you, well, at least some of you, had another option, but uh, chose to be here, and that warms my heart. Uh, so I have been asked to talk about bureaucrats in the deep state, um, though it's the subject matter of the lecture that I'll mainly focus on is the operations of the so-called military-industrial congressional complex. But uh, the same analysis can be applied to I mean, other elements uh, in the regulatory bureaucracy or other types of bureaucracies that have the ability to bestow favors and uh, uh, implement graft and all those things that we like. Um, so in regarding this term, which, I mean, I didn't pick the title of this talk, this deep state, uh, I guess we should define it. And I mean, there's not really any clear agreed upon definition of what the deep state is. Uh, so I'll tell you what I mean by it. Well, I'll maybe not be super precise, but tell you what I don't mean by it. And what I don't mean is this you know, blue-pilled NPC definition that you'll see on Wikipedia, where it uh, involves this conspiracy theory about a clandestine network of members of the intelligence agencies working in conjunction with high-level financial industrial en entities to exercise power alongside or within the U elected U.S. government. Uh, that might exist. So it's, I think, um, yeah, this kind of definition really is trying to muddy the waters, uh, gaslight us into being like, oh, you, know, you talk about this entity, it's just all uh, fake conspiracy theory stuff. But what I mean is like those, uh, well, things we can clearly see. So I, um, it's not necessarily a fully inclusive definition, but part of what I'm talking about. Uh, bureaucrats that operate with de facto, at least, uh, unaccountability. I mean, in a de jure sense, I mean, how things are supposed to work in your uh, schoolhouse rock version. You know, you uh, elect representatives. They're supposed to uh, hold bureaucrats accountable. So if bureaucrats aren't doing their jobs right, then your elected representatives are supposed to uh, punish them in some way. But um, or, and they're supposed to make the rules, just like another Schoolhouse Rock video about how, uh, you know, I'm just a bill and uh, eventually I become a law, but these uh, bureaucratic agencies often uh, make rules of their own. And um, the thing is, Congress has an interest in having that be the case, that they don't have to be uh, directly uh, electorally responsible for a lot of rules that bureaucracies create. Um, so. I mean, often what people are referring to are defense-related agencies, but I'm not limited, limiting uh, the analysis to them, though I'll mainly, as I said, be talking about the military-industrial complex, or congressional also should be part of that, though that um, feels a bit clunky to say, military-industrial-congressional complex, the MICC. And I'd say another feature tied in with this electoral unaccountability is the fact that uh, whoever's in control of the White House or Congress, it doesn't seem to change much uh, in terms of policies of these, in, in a general sense, of these uh, bureaucratic agencies. And I, what I really want to emphasize here is that a lot of what we can explain doesn't require uh, nefarious motivations on parts of uh, the bureaucrats and other special interests that are part of this um, uh, I don't want to say cabal, I'll make more uh, a charitable term. Uh, but what I don't like about the conspiracy theorize, not that that doesn't exist, I, I'd say we want to focus on, as economists, what can be explained in, say, a Hayekian sense of um, the things that are of human action but not of human design. That I think there is kind of a perverse, spontaneous order uh, among uh, these actors that we'll talk about, the bureaucracy, Congress, uh, and special interests. And so seeing how far we can get by just uh, analyzing individual incentives before we talk about some you know, uh, marionette strings being pulled, I think is um, useful to start with that, see how far we can get with that. So like um, yesterday's lecture, I focus on bureaucracy. That is uh, those kind of bureaucratic management being the opposite of profit and loss based management as it's um, not subject to monetary accounting methods in the same way, that we don't know what 
um, consumers are actually willing to pay for when things are provided bureaucratically. I include this quote from uh, Mises' Bureaucracy, in which he talks about one of these agencies frequently associated with uh, the deep state. He says, the objectives of public administration cannot be measured in money terms and cannot be checked by accountancy methods. Take a nationwide police system like the FBI. There is no yardstick available that could establish whether the expenses incurred by one of its regional or local branches were not excessive. And he means excessive in terms of what consumers want. We don't know where, I mean, even if we assume that all the outputs created by the FBI are actually desired by consumers, we don't know at which point uh, marginal cost becomes greater than marginal benefit. Of course, from the perspective of the bureaucracy, like, they believe they're doing good things. Like, if we have more resources, we can do more good things. So, um, so I'll talk about later in the lecture. I mean, we can model bureaucracies as wanting to maximize their budgets, and not necessarily just for self-interested reasons, but because they legitimately could believe that they're uh, doing good things. It's like, I mean, pick whatever bureaucracy you want. They, I know, we're all underfunded. Um, so I, I think what a helpful starting point in um, understanding the phenomenon uh, that we see with the military industrial complex is to assume away the calculation problem. What if there were no calculation problem? Because I want to argue that this is a necessary input into the cronyism that we see. So regarding the defense industry, say if there were no calculation problem and we knew exactly what um, defense inputs were needed, that we could be at that point where uh, marginal benefit equals marginal cost, or I guess in a more uh, discrete Austrian sense, we, do, we stop where uh, before we reach the point where the marginal cost of an additional unit of uh, defense is greater than, uh, or the cost of which is greater than the marginal benefit. Um, you know, the state wouldn't procure more than uh, was economically efficient. They wouldn't pay a higher price for it. And as such, the private, private industry, defense contractors, wouldn't have any incentive to lobby for any spending beyond that. And essentially, we wouldn't um, have the military industrial congressional complex as we know it. But of course, um, we do have it as we know it. Well, so the actual state, there is this calculation problem. They're not able to determine at which point um, whether bureaucratic outputs are value added. And so this leads to a number of phenomena which I'll uh, describe, including uh, rent seeking and rent extraction, the, the so-called revolving door, uh, local politics versus the national interest, um, various uh, bureaucratic incentives that facilitate these phenomena. And last, I got kind of tacked on that might not be super well integrated, but I feel is important to talk about since so many resources appear to be expended on it, which is capturing the media in order to ensure um, certain narratives are prominent. So regarding this, uh, these concepts of rent seeking and rent extraction, these have been, I think, talked about in at least a couple of lectures this week, but to uh, review these ideas. So when we're talking about rent seeking, we're talking about um, the expenditure of resources, I mean, to capture political rents. Um, I mean, these could best be understood as legal bribes by which, say, a defense contractor curries the favor of a political decision maker. And uh, both parties really understand this as a legal bribe, but of course, in public, they don't, they, they don't want to publicize this. Um, I mean, we can think of uh, a number of ways. I mean, who mentioned uh, you know, donations to the Clinton Foundation or paying uh, exorbitant sums for speeches? I mean, this, uh, it's, it's understood what the purpose of these things are. And I mean, this is really something that only happens uh, in the public sector. It doesn't really make sense in the private sector, right? Um, say a private entrepreneur trying to bribe you, uh, say, I don't know, here's buy my $10 product, I'll bribe you $5 to pay for my $10 product. It's just a price decrease, right? Um, the bribing doesn't really make sense in that context, unless perhaps we're talking about a principal agent problem. If uh, Bertie Wooster has uh, Jeeves go buy something for him and uh, Jeeves uh, is bribed by one of the providers, then maybe there's uh, 
potential principal agent problem, but Birdie can go check, can go check uh, Jeeves's work. Like, did you find the best deal? Why'd you pick this one, Jeeves? That's more expensive. Um, so, so I wanna say categorically that there's no potential for um, bribery in a private context, but it's much less pronounced than when we're talking about a political allocation process where a member or staffer of Congress or Pentagon brass is making procurement decisions um, on behalf of taxpayers. I mean, there's more room, and, and because the taxpayer can't go say, oh, you paid too much for this, but because there's no established market for defense outputs, no civilian market, it's often a novel good, like what's the market price of an F-35? Like, we don't know. Did you overpay for this? I, we can't know. And so it's much harder um, than in an established market context to say whether something was overpaid for. And the payments these forms can take, so mentioned uh, donations to the Clinton Foundation. I'd like to see how much those dropped off after 2016. Uh, this could be direct uh, campaign contributions or payments in kind. And uh, some fun examples of payments in kind. So uh, going way back, the Senate investigation in 1975 found evidence that at least 10 major defense contractors, um, including Northrop, operated lush entertainment facilities for Pentagon brass. They include quail and pheasant shooting preserves, which probably, well, definitely before Dick Cheney came along to, uh, <laughs> you, know, you don't want uh, anyone offing who you're uh, trying to curry favor with. Um, yachts and recreational facilities in exotic warm climates. So these are the kinds of things, you know, take you on a nice trip, show you a good time. This is ways, these are ways of uh, private defense industry contractors currying favor with uh, political actors. So that's rent seeking. I wanna talk about um, rent extraction, which is, which is kind of the mirror image of that. So if we think of rent seeking being, say someone, a private contractor trying to get a favorable regulation or contract with a government actor, rent extraction is kind of the government actor maybe threatening a, a negative regulation, say, well, you know, I won't pass this regulation if you know, contribute to my campaign. So it's the payment still going the same way. It's just kind of the impetus is from the uh, political actor's side and um, call this rent extraction. Uh, related phenomenon of so-called revolving door, this observed phenomenon of certain personnel moving between a certain type of bureaucracy, in this case we'll use the military as an example, and then moving to Congress either as an elected official or a staffer or to the defense industry, and then a lateral movement between Congress or the defense industry. And uh, I wanna emphasize that this is kind of a natural phenomenon. We don't have to assume anything uh, nefarious going on, but as a natural response to the epistemic problem of bureaucratically provided uh, defense. That is, we can think, so a member of the military retiring, going into Congress either as uh, an elected official or a staffer, I mean, they have this expertise, this military expertise. They've used the equipment. They know what is useful for military applications. This could be useful in Congress in terms of knowing what uh, defense items to procure um, in dealing with this knowledge problem caused by bureaucracy. Um, likewise, if the uh, member of the military retires and goes into the defense industry, this is also, they have useful expertise for the defense industry. Um, knowing what uh, is useful in the military. Or you can think of this lateral movement, um, someone in, who's been in Congress understands this procurement process and how it works. This can be in useful information to the defense industry if they move uh, from Congress to the defense industry. Um, in addition to having certain contacts um, within that decision-making process. So it, to put this in its most charitable terms, like. We can understand this revolving door as dealing with uh, the epistemological problems uh, involved in not having a legitimate market for defense-related goods. Um, but, of course, this uh, leads to a number of issues. Um, we'll talk about the cost distortions and dysfunctions of this revolving door. So uh, the first one, big one, um, is that technological or technical expertise can't be a substitute 
for economic value. So I'm mean, thinking back to uh, Dr. Newman's lecture on socialism, when he talked about a bridge, like say you have technical expertise on how to make a really strong bridge, you can make the best bridge ever. That's without market prices, we can't determine is that the most economically valuable use of those resources? Would, I mean, we could uh, say platinum is a more uh, technologically superior method of making railroad tracks compared to steel. Like, should we make uh, railroad tracks out of platinum? Well, if we have market price, we'd say no. The, not, the most valuable use of platinum isn't railroad tracks, even if it is technologically superior. There are other uses of platinum that are more valuable. And so this technological expertise that someone might get from their experience in the military is no substitute for um, knowing what actually is the most economically uh, feasible. Uh, it doesn't separate the technologically feasible from the um, economically efficient. So it's not a substitute. Secondly, we see that political expertise is actually more useful than this technological expertise. So when we think of the procurement process uh, of procuring military equipment, I mean, it's not like a, a, a developed market with all these options. You know, it's not you know, Nicolas Cage showing you all these weapons, look at all these things you can buy. Rather, it's these, you just have these narrow administratively, administratively determined choice set uh, determined by this monopsonistic buyer of the federal government and provided by this oligopolistic uh, defense industry. And a lot of times it's not even, here's what's available, try out these uh, weapons, see if you like them. It's conjectural, it's proposals for new programs. Like give us a few billion dollars and we'll develop F-35s or Star Wars or whatever things. And so instead of competition, it's not like Congress or the Pentagon, not in all cases at least, is going to defense contractors and specifying, here's exactly what we need. Who can fulfill this contract at the lowest price? Rather, it's defense contractors coming up with proposals and presenting these to um, the Pentagon and Congress. And so they're not competing on price so much as who can display more competence. That is, who, um, if they're the, the revolvers in this revolving door, if they have this experience with this contractor and in the military, can they vouch for this person? Um, what's their reputation like? Th these are the things uh, upon which decisions are made. And so it's more about having these, this political expertise and political connections rather than actually having, I, that's more important than the technical expertise of what to produce or what will be useful for the military. And so this leads to perverse incentives for cost enhancement rather than cost control. Um, because I mean, ultimately, I mean, even once a decision is made, I, maybe there are, I find there are delays, there are cost overruns. Uh, was this a bad decision? Well, we don't have profit and loss, so we can't tell whether that was a bad decision or not. It's, it's the untestable nature of these claims and these vaguer attributes, more vague than uh, profit and loss, but okay, was this uh, an acceptable cost overrun? Was this uh, F-35 that doesn't work? Is that, I mean, we have nothing to compare it to because it's this novel good. And so in a lot of ways, like things can be fudged at the margins. And these perverse incentives, uh, what, what, what I find interesting about it is that from both sides, there are incentives to inflate costs. So. It's obvious from the revolver on the defense industry side why Ka, he wants to like, make as many contracts as possible with the DOD and get them to pay a good price for them. But why is that the case for the other side? Well, if you think about it from the congressional side, if you're making these deals and paying a good price for them, well, the defense industry is going to, or whichever company you're doing business with, they're going to remember this. Like, they'll come to bat for you later. You are increasing your value uh, in this revolving door market. You know? And by contrast, if, say, you're a real budget hawk, and you're like, oh, no, this costs too much. We, we don't want it. Give us a better deal. The defense industry is going to remember that, too, and uh, probably not scratch your back if you're looking to exit Congress at some point. And so the incentive is 
do enhance costs from both sides. Um, because, well, both sides benefit. Who pays for it? The taxpayer. And uh, I'll, I'll talk about why um, there's not really an effective mechanism on their uh, part to uh, control this in a bit. And so when we think about the selection process for these, uh, the revolvers, as I'll call them, the individuals revolving between, uh, revolving around this triangle, it selects for conformity to this process and against cost reduction. If you're, uh, you know, Mr. Smith going to Washington and looking to reform this, uh, you're not going to last very long. Um, it's going to select against those who want to control costs or um, truly act uh, in the interest of taxpayers. And further, I mean, last thing I want to say about this is that more oversight can't solve the problem, partially because I mean, the selection of who would be overseers is going to be subject to that same selection process. If you're an overseer, it's going to be more in your interest to, like, if you, even if you believe something's uh, too costly, to say, well, uh, yeah, no, no, this is great. Because you're also going to be more attractive to uh, the defense industry once you get out of that uh, oversight position. And because, again, to um, emphasize that, because there's no actual market with market prices, you can't objectively say there was a cost overrun here, too much is being paid. It's like compared to what, right? Uh, you can really just say like, well, that's your opinion, man, you know, um, because there's nothing to compare it to. And so this lack of um, calculation leads to this inability to have something objective to compare it to. And this issue of local politics versus the national interest so if we're thinking of you know, the state truly trying to serve taxpayers, like say they have a specified goal, even though um, we can't say it's uh, economically most efficient, but say we specify a goal. Once that's specified, let's achieve it in the most cost-efficient manner possible. Uh, we would think that's what they would do. Um, thinking of uh, Dr. Durabot's talk on specialization and the division of labor, you'd want to take advantage of that to the fullest extent possible. Um, though perhaps, um, just on a national scale, uh, Dr. Durabot in her talk on trade said a potential reason uh, for trade restrictions not having to do with you know, economic policy so much as defense is maybe we want to produce everything within our borders so we're not um, vulnerable to supply chain issues if we get into war with someone. So, so I say here, defense based on cost minimization would try to take, at least within national borders, take full advantage of the division of labor and specialization. Is that what we see? Well, of course not. Uh, elected officials often attempt to bring military funds to their district. So uh, rather than have things produced where it's uh, most cost effective. So the picture I have here, this is of the C-17 cargo jet, and um, so as an illustration of this, in 2008, uh, the Secretary of Defense said that the current order of 205 of these C-17 cargo jets for, would meet the Air Force's current projected needs. However, uh, Congress uh, ignored that. They're like, oh, well, we want more of them, even though the uh, Secretary of Defense says we don't need any more. So uh, Boeing uh, manufactures the C-17, and they estimated that this uh, program supported 650 suppliers and more than 30,000 jobs across 44 states. Now, I mean, I don't know how likely it is that having production spread out that much is the, uh, takes advantage of uh, all cost efficiencies, but I doubt it. Uh, and defense contractors understand this. And another example of this is uh, Lockheed Martin's F-35 uh, Joint Strike Fighter the production of which is spread across 45 states. So it, I mean, they're making decisions rather than on economic efficiency, uh, they're making those decisions based on what's politically most feasible to continue uh, the gravy train going. And um, hinted at this concept, like pretty central to uh, public choice thought of concentrated benefits and dispersed costs. This is, if we were to, um, they naively think about democracy. 
would think, well, what would a politician want to do? Well, they'd do the greatest good for the greatest number, right? Because that's going to generate the most votes, and the most votes wins, right? Um, but we don't see that. And why is that? Well, as we think, in this case, right, what does the most good? Well, achieving this goal at the lowest cost. But in this case, we have concentrated benefits, like among those who are producing the planes. Uh, we have dispersed costs among all taxpayers. So if you're one of these individuals producing, working in one of these factories and your paycheck depends on this program continuing, like you have a very good incentive to pay attention to what your congressman or congresswoman is doing uh, regarding this program. Whereas if you are a taxpayer, say a relatively small portion of your taxes are going to fund this program. So you don't have much of an incentive to pay attention to what your congressman or woman is uh, doing in this case. And so this is an example of concentrated benefits and dispersed costs. Even though the, uh, the total amount of the dispersed costs is greater than the total amount of the concentrated benefits, uh, the political salience of the dispersed costs isn't enough to get you know, voters who have, I mean, because there's how many other programs they have to pay attention to. Um, it's going to be what determines your income, where your benefits are concentrated, uh, is going to determine what you as a voter pay attention to. Oh, on well, this issue of bureaucratic incentives, I'm, what I love about this graph that I also used yesterday is that you can just replace whatever you want with it and uh, get the same effect. So I mentioned we can model bureaucrats as wanting to maximize their budgets and power. Not, I mean, it's fortunate for them that, uh, I mean, yeah, this fits in with their own self-interest, uh, but I mean, they could, if we give them the benefit of the doubt, think like, yes, if we're, uh, defense is important, the more resources we have uh, to defend the country, the better. Um, and we can't say otherwise because we don't, are not in any objective accounting sense because we don't know what these curves look like. Uh, we don't know where we are along these curves. I mean, I can, I have a general idea, um, but we can't say, oh, we're at a point where um, the marginal cost of defense is greater than the marginal benefit. And this is the same for any other type of bureaucracy. Uh, in his book, Bureaucracy, Mises has this very interesting section talking about the bureaucrat as a voter. And um, especially when we reach this critical mass in which uh, the bureaucrats and others who uh, receive their income from the state uh, perform, like, form quite a large voting block. So um, one of the things Mises says about the bureaucrat as a voter is that his pecuniary interest as employee, or I should explain this, so he says in a democracy, a bureaucrat is both an employer of the state you know, as a citizen and an employee as you know, a public employee. And so his interest as employee towers above his interest as employer, you know, as a taxpayer, as he gets much more from the public funds than he contributes to them. Let's say a uh, further thing of what Rothbard has to say about the subject, like, well, he contributes nothing at all. <laughs> the, the idea that public employees pay taxes is just an accounting fiction. But whether we you know, take that position or uh, accept the accounting fiction that public employees pay taxes, it's clear that they uh, receive a lot more than they pay in. And as such, the bureaucrat as voter is more eager to get a pay raise than to keep the budget balance. His main concern is to swell the payroll. And if we I mean, continue along with our assumption that bureauc bureaucracies are creating valued outputs, it's like, why is a bureaucrat or public employee, would you ever want to cut anything? Where it's like, you're not paying into it or paying in relatively little. And uh, you're getting all these benefits paid for by someone else. It seems like the only constraint is, um, as with any parasite, you don't want to kill the host. And this, uh, I find it interesting how Mises talks about that. I mean, he's talking about this in the context of uh, France and Germany before they um, got rid of their democratic institutions at the time. Uh, this, la this third um, excerpt is talking about this issue when you have this critical mass of people who either as public employees or contractors or who are on the dole, uh, 
says their main concern was to get more out of the public funds as voters. They did not care for ideal issues like liberty, justice, and the supremacy of the law and good government. They asked for more money, that was all. No candidate for parliament, provincial diets, or town councils could risk opposing the appetite of the public employees for a raise. The various political parties were eager to outdo one another in munificence. And if we think about, say, voting patterns among uh, residents of places like the District of Columbia, it's like clear that their uh, political loyalties are to those who are going to expand the bureaucracy. So, um, yeah, what do you want to say about uh, democracy? And I just want to share some numbers here as about, I mean, these are a little dated. Um, this is from 2015, about the U.S. Department of Defense being the country's largest employer. With 1.4 million men and women on active duty, 850,000 civilian employees, 836,000 select reserves, and 245,000 individual ready reserve forces. But this does not include the significant number of people who work in jobs that supply the U.S. military with goods and services, which is estimated to total more than 1.5 million. And so you have a large, uh, a fairly sizable portion of the population that wants to, uh, that has a direct financial stake in um, defense spending being maintained and growing. Uh, now I'm talking about personnel decisions. <laughs> so, I mean, when we think about personnel decisions made by an entrepreneur making hiring decisions, uh, say the profit maximizing entrepreneur doesn't want to discriminate based on factors other than productivity, because this is going to, I mean, as a residual claimant, uh, this is going to cost him. So it's um, yeah, contrary to profit maximization to discriminate based on anything other than productivity. Now, this isn't to say that a private entrepreneur might not or, or will never do this. Um, Rothbard in Man, Economy, and State talks about an entrepreneur hiring his never-do-well nephew um, at the expense of a cut in profits. Maybe he does this because you know, he loves his nephew or wants to do a favor to, for his sister. Um, but the point is, this is an act of consumption on his part. He's not acting as an entrepreneur maximizing profits. However, um, for a bureaucrat who's not a residual claimant, um, this is, I want to say, uh, well, the cost and benefit calculation is different. right? If they uh, decide to hire people not based on, um, well, I guess they can't hire based on economic productivity because that's not being measured within the bureaucracy, but maybe some form of competence. Um, oh, they're not going to sacrifice their personal incomes. And the costs, unlike in, uh, a, in private industry where it can be measured in profit and loss statements, a manager can say, well, you've been hiring a lot of these people and losing a lot of money. What's going on? Um, an overseer of a, a bureaucratic decision maker can't say the same thing because they're not, um, there's not profit and loss accounting in the same way. But uh, the costs manifest themselves in different ways, um, perhaps in terms of a presidential candidate getting shot. And so, uh, the, uh, so the costs manifest themselves, but not in a way that can be often directly relevant to bureaucratic decision makers, especially when um, they aren't punished. And uh, in thinking about this, uh, this is more uh, a speculation on my part. Here I'm getting not into more conspiratorial grounds, but more speculative grounds, is whether there is a benefit in hiring less competent people within the bureaucracy. That is, uh, in terms of having someone you know, more dedicated um, to the survival of the bureaucracy, that is, if you hire more competent people who presumably have um, higher opportunity costs outside of the bureaucracy, say, um, if it's the case that you, know, you hire a competent person, but um, okay, a candidate comes along who wants to make massive cuts to government, you're like, well, that's okay, I'll get a job in the private sector, that's pretty good too. Um, but if you're not competent and you're earning huge rents, which I believe uh, well, quite a few uh, bureaucrats in DC do, um, the average salary is much more than the average private sector salary, most of them are going to take a quite large pay cut. And, uh, and because of that, are going to be more dedicated to the survival of the bureaucracy uh, as a political class. They are. So I'm like, eh, maybe there's something there, but I haven't done any uh, empirical uh, research to verify whether there is much of an effect of that. But it makes you think. This last thing, or last 
or maybe close to the last item I want to talk about, is uh, this influence over media. So that's the reason like, I find this interesting, is I, my mental model of how um, media works has altered quite a bit. I mean, I think a more naive view, say, of the news media might think, well, what do consumers want? Uh, if you ask them, I mean, maybe they'd say something like, I want this unbiased source of news that keeps me informed. Um, whether most people want that, I'm not sure, but maybe they'd say that. And if that were the case, then you'd think the profit-maximizing entrepreneur wants to provide them with an unbiased source of news that uh, gives them all the important information they need. And because that's what advertisers would want to pay for, right? Uh, there'd be more eyeballs. This would be more valuable to advertisers. Um, but then we see a lot of things that doesn't seem to conform to that uh, kind of model. So think of this of uh, Northrop Grumman. Why do they advertise? I mean, here, I mean, they, we have the military bowl presented by Northrop Grumman. Maybe you'd say, oh, this creates goodwill. Like, I like my bowl games. Thank you, Northrop Grumman, uh, for this American institution. Um, but why, but they don't have any consumer products to advertise, right? They're mainly selling uh, goods to the government. And, I mean, or, I mean, this is even clear with, uh, you know, today's news brought to you by Pfizer. If, if that's the, if today's news is brought to you by Pfizer, would you expect today's news to, you know, be critical of Pfizer? Provide you with news of maybe, uh, well, defective products, say, by Pfizer. We'll be careful what we say um, for the live stream. Hey, and there's examples of this. Uh, I think a relatively good journalist, um, Cheryl Atkinson, she used to work for CBS News. She had a number, this investigative journalist, um, having stories that, say, were shed light on things certain, in, certain advertisers uh, didn't want, wouldn't, would rather people not know. Um, those stories weren't aired. So uh, I think a more accurate model of media might um, be more something like, well, we know that resources tend to flow to their most highly valued use. Um, the most highly valued use of news media might not be providing accurate information to people, or fully accurate and um, fully informed, but rather presenting a certain narrative. That is, um, if there were a bidding war between people who want full and accurate news media and um, special interests expressing they're willing to pay through advertising to um, media conglomerates, right, probably the latter has a greater interest, whereas your average normie is like, well, I mean, I get most of the good news I want, or news that I want, um, maybe something on the margins isn't quite full, and I'm okay with that. Um, but given the amount of investment made in this area, I think it's probably crucial to keep keeping this uh, gravy train going. Another th phenomenon we observe is just uh, the amount of personnel from executive agencies that, well, I mean, maybe this should be part of the revolving door as well. Um, so here I have a picture of different talking heads at MSNBC, um, either currently or formerly employed by the CIA, FBI, DEA, DOJ, and U.S. Army. Seems to be, I mean, who needs state-run media when you have um, all this? And in addition to the legacy media, we also have, I mean, you have your alternative source of media, social media. Um, big uh, social media companies either hiring these former spooks or I mean, directly communicating with them. There's in a number of cases making their way through courts regarding um, executive agencies like the CDC or FDA. Uh, making suggestions, I guess, to uh, social media companies over what to censor, what to, um, or what to publish in, in the name of misinformation or disinformation controlling such things. So clearly they have uh, quite a stake in controlling these narratives. Um, so uh, I want to conclude with some self-promotion, or really also a thought. So um, it, or contribute to a... a chapter to an upcoming volume. Dr. Jonathan Newman did as well. It's a, a volume in honor of Robert Higgs. It's called The Legacy of Robert Higgs, hopefully coming out later this year. And the chapter I wrote was called If Angels Were to Govern Men. 
and this was in reference to an essay Robert Higgs wrote in response to James Madison in the Federalist Papers, where Madison considers this question. He says, well, if, if angels were men, or if men were angels, rather, uh, no government would be necessary. If angels were to govern men, neither external nor internal controls upon government would be necessary. And I'm like, well, let's think about that. So even if you had angels manning the government, you still have a number of calculation problems. Um, unless they, I mean, I, making certain assumptions about the epistemological abilities of angels. But, um, so you might have less cronyism on certain margins, but ultimately I conclude that even if angels were available to be elected and to man the bureaucracy, they probably wouldn't be elected. And this is because political institutions, or even democratic, or maybe especially democratic ones, uh, necessarily give power to some over others. And those who capture control over such institutions will be those who value it most highly. And those who value it most highly will be those who are best able to use it to extract resources from some to enrich themselves and their allies. And so I, I come to this, I mean, almost ironic conclusion that um, I mean, mainstream economists, they justify a lot of state action based on something being a public good and underprovided by free markets. But the irony is that the, the institution of state the state makes good governance itself a public good. That is, there's less of an incentive to get into politics to not use that power than it is there is to uh, get in that, those positions to yield that power to enrich oneself. And so uh, ironically, good governance under a state is a public good. So, um, I, so I see these problems being inherent within the bureaucracy itself and um, if you had good people to man the bureaucracy, they probably wouldn't get into those positions. But um, so I, I see it as a whole uh, <laughs> total problem within itself. And with that, I will conclude. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>